All right, guys. So it's been in the news, and I printed out the whole entire memo. Today, we're going to look at Google's ideological echo chamber. This was written by the now, unfortunately, let go employee. He was an engineer. His name was James Damore. And he basically wrote a very long and well thought out little, I don't even call it article or just analysis on what he thinks are certain things that Google's culture can improve on. And you no, know, first of all, it's not an anti-diversity memo, okay? He's all for diversity. He just doesn't agree with this sort of limiting of discussion and thought. That's all he's trying to talk about. But, you know, most journalists probably didn't really read the whole thing. So I'll do all of you guys a favor. Let's read this and let us go through it because we're going to learn a lot of good stuff from this. So first things first, I love his little format. You see, he's got an outline. He says, if we can't have an honest discussion about this, then we can never truly solve the problem. Yeah, that's true. If we can't have an honest discussion about anything, it doesn't matter if this is about diversity, this is about politics, if this is about anything, parenting. If we can't just sit down and talk about it, we're never going to reach any sort of consensus, right? That's what he's saying. That's why he's writing this. So very good. And then um, psychological safety is built on mutual respect and acceptance. But unfortunately, our culture of shaming and misrepresentation is disrespectful and unaccepting of anyone outside its echo chamber. Chamber. That's true. You know, if you, you think differently, or you're branded a racist, you think differently, you're branded a sexist. Um, on the, I'm thinking from the right, right? If you think if if a conservative looks at a looks at someone who doesn't think like them, ooh, they're blasphemous, or oh my God, they're um they're gay, right? They, they I I made a video the other day. I was um calling out Lauren Southern. And you should see how many comments like you're a fag or something like that. It's like just because I called her out. You, you, so it's like it's both sides, right? The right uses words to try to shame the left and the left uses words to try to shame the right. And you could expand this to just any other label you give people, basically a set of ideologies. So it's true. If we, if we can um, just have a discussion, we can't have a discussion that's civil and doesn't involve disrespect, then yeah, we're never going to go step beyond our echo chamber. One of the things I like is one of my friends, Nate, he's very liberal, progressive liberal, very different from I am. I would consider myself um, as close to a conservative libertarian as possible. Uh, but we have good civil discussions and we learn from each other. And But if either I or him try to be disrespectful, we're never going to agree or even talk again. We're just never going to talk politics again. We're never going to learn. And so why is consensus? Why is all of this stuff necessary? See, the thing about our democracy is that to win any election, you have to get at least 50% of the vote. So our democracy forces anyone to consider the opinions of at least 50% of the population. And we know a population is distributed a certain way, right? Because of a population's distribution, if you have to get at least 50% of the population in whatever election, you have to be able to not just talk to people who really agree with you and people who kind of agree with you, but you have to be able to find middle ground with people who maybe might not agree with you. That's the beauty of our democracy. That's what makes our democracy able to take into account the needs of more than just a few, right? Um, when, um, when our founding fathers were, were designing our system. One of the things they were afraid of is, hey, tyranny of the majority. They had designed safeguards against this. So getting back to this, the next funny thing I wanted to mention about his, his little essay or whatever is, look at this, too long didn't read. I wrote on the side. He definitely uses Reddit. <laughs> he's using the Reddit format. Basically, he's trying, to, he's trying to, if you don't have time to read my 10 page, I got a little summary for you. Right? Google's political biases has equated freedom from offense with psychological safety. Um, this silence has created an ideological echo chamber. The lack of discussion fosters the most extreme and authoritarian elements of this ideology. Differences in distributions of traits between men and women may in part explain why we don't have 50% representation of women in tech and leadership. See, this is where this is where he starts triggering people because people just can't accept that um, 
biology and psychology wise men and women are different right we'll go back to that later because he draws a beautiful graph that illustrates this um discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair divisive and bad for business in other words it's reverse discrimination if you're discriminating to make things fair you're reverse discriminating <laughs> next he starts going in depth right this is the background background people generally have good intentions now I wrote on the side, do they? See, the thing is, maybe he's just, you know, most of my friends in college, I went to University of Pennsylvania, so I went to an Ivy League like he did. Most of my friends were engineers like him, you know, like his type. And the reason I got along with engineers was because engineers tended to be, what's the right word, more naive? As in, they just believe you just work hard, you do your thing, and then you just go for it, you make it in life. I couldn't stand warrant people. You know, warrant people, you just want to hit them in the face. And we have one in office right now. And I, so a lot of people in the college were unsufferable. Unfortunately, I was part of the college, so I'm talking shit about my own. But I loved the engineers. And the, the nursing school at Penn, they were also busy trying to you know, get a job right out of school. So they were like working long hours. Never saw the nursing people. But the engineers, I hung out with a lot. I loved engineers. But I feel like this statement is like such an engineer naivete statement. People generally have good intentions. What I would say is, People don't have good intentions. People are very self-centered. So people always have their own intentions in mind. It's very, very rare for people to have other intentions that are in front of their own. So people can have other people's intentions in mind, but only if it's second to their own. Some people, you know, the worst people in the world, they can't even have other people's intentions. They only have their own intentions. But a good, mature, grown-up person has their own intentions and the other people's intentions considered too. But nonetheless, People have their own intentions, right? They, they, they care about themselves, they're self-centered the most. And the beauty of capitalism is that it channels everyone's own self-centered self-interest and you turn it into something productive that helps society grow. That's why capitalism works so well. That's why it's turned countries rich. You turn people's self-serving interests, you help them get to a certain point where they're helping out society. That's what capitalism is. So anyways, People generally have good intentions, which I, I qualify that statement, but we all have biases which are invisible to us. Now that's true, you know, all of us, our eyes aren't perfect, our minds aren't perfect, we're not completely rational, we, we're emotional too, yes, we all have biases, which is good. Um, open and honest discussion with those who disagree can highlight our blind spots, which is true. So, um, so he, he lists a pretty cool after the background, he talks a little bit about sort of biases that he sort of, um, he, he summarizes from the differences between the left as in progressives, aka socialists, aka liberals, and then the right, aka conservatives, um, whatever you call them, um, classical liberals, etc. But, so, of course, Google, the media, the social sciences, they lean right, left, that's what he says. Um, he lists out some of these prejudices, so let's look at some of the prejudices. The left, um, they favor compassion for the weak. Disparities that the left usually thinks are due to injustices. The left usually thinks that humans are inherently cooperative. Is that true? Does the left think that? I feel like if the left thought that the humans were inherently cooperative, why are they so nanny state about it, right? If the left really thought that humans inherently always work together, why would you make government so big to try to control people in economics, try to control people? I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's just me. The left thinks change is good. Yeah, that's true. Uh, with the exception of discussion, of course. Uh, anyways, um, the left tends to be more open. I don't know about now, but maybe, maybe in the past. Maybe in his engineer world, the left is more open. The left tends to be more ideal, idealistic. That I disagree with. Is the left more idealistic? The problem with what Daymore, James Daymore did here is that a lot of these things, especially the, the idealistic elements, the left is idealistic in certain ways and the right is idealistic in certain ways, right? They're, they're both idealistic in different ways. Like the right's very idealistic about 
business, right, and finances, and um, the sort of the human animal spirits, the right's very idealistic about it. They're like, yeah, you know, business people always have society in mind. They always care about their employees. And the left maybe has other things that they're very idealistic about. Like, oh yeah, if we have government control this, the government's always gonna do a good job. They're never gonna try to um, do a shitty job. They're never gonna take money from the people. So I don't agree with, with what he says, that the left is more idealistic. So he says, the right has a higher respect for strong, aka authority, which is true. Um, and he actually mentioned, I've looked at, I've listed two interviews with this guy, and Dave Moore says that uh, he's watched Jonathan Haidt. I recommend all of you guys go look at Jonathan Haidt. Haidt is a, he's a social slash moral psychologist who talks about the differences between the left and the right. And I can see a lot of this. Um, basically what Jonathan Haidt talks about is moral foundations, right? There's five moral foundations between, and the left and the right di differ with what pillars they use for their moral foundations. But I'm not gonna talk about that because that's not really directly related to James Damore's. So, besides respect for strength and authority, what the right believes is that disparities are natural and just, as in it wasn't because of you know some people preventing other people or doing anything like that. It really was because it was of either natural differences or it really came from some people worked harder than others, etc. And then humans are inherently competitive, which I disagree with. I don't think the right inherently thinks that, right? I mean, like when I think of the right, I think of people going to church. I think of people who favor communities. If the right really thought that humans were all competitive, I don't think they would be the type who, you know, donate to charity, the, the churches, etc. Anyways, the, the right agrees what he says, the right cares more about stability. They think change is dangerous. They're more closed and they're more pragmatic as in they're more about let's just see actual results, let's just do. So what I'm going to say height, but that's not the same. What Damore says is neither side is 100% correct and both viewpoints are necessary for a functioning society or in this case company. Which I like because, you know, I, I tend to lean a little right words, but I definitely want to always encourage my fans to look at the left's arguments too. You have to find middle ground, right? There's a reason why not every problem in this world can be solved by capitalism or not every problem of this world can be solved by limited government. There's a reason for that. And it's because as much as I hate to admit it, sometimes the left has one or two good points. So you have to be able to find what's good on the other sides or different people that disagree with you. And hopefully you come up with a stronger position slash stronger ideology that incorporates more stuff that works. So. Only facts and reason can shed light on these biases. But when it comes to diversity and inclusion, Google's left bias has created a politically correct monoculture that maintains its hold by shaming dissenters into silence. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but a lot of my videos actually um, got demonetized because Google thinks they might offend people. They might offend people running ads on it. So Google automatically demonetized me. And then I have to literally um, like argue, which I'm, you know, I have a full-time job, so I don't, I, I'm not reliant on Google for, for any sort of income, so I'm not gonna spend the time to argue, but like, I can see what he means by this. This is the part that I think, if anyone read it and didn't understand it, they would really get angry about it. Possible non-biased causes of gender gap in tech, right? This is when he goes in depth, this is the fun part. So, at Google, what he says, we're regularly told that implicit, unconscious, and explicit biases are holding women back in tech and leadership. Of course, men and women experience bias, tech, and the workplace differently, and we should be cognizant of this, but it's far from the whole story. Okay, I'm, I'm getting interested. So on average, men and women biologically differ in many ways. I hope everyone can at least accept that, okay? Men have breast. I mean, men have breasts. Women, men have breasts. Oh, that's hilarious. Women have breasts, right? The, the reproductive systems are different. The upper body strengths are different. There's different levels of receptor for estrogen in the brain, depending on men versus women. There's a lot of differences. Hormonal, genetic. I mean, look, men have a Y chromosome. Women don't. There's a lot of biological differences, right? I hope we can accept that. 
So these differences aren't just socially constructed, he says, because they're universal across human cultures, they have clear biological causes and links to prenatal testosterone, biological males that were castrated at birth and raised as females often still identify and act like males. The underlying traits are highly heritable. They're exactly what we would predict from an evolutionary psychology perspective. And just so you know, a lot of people in the science fields have agreed with him basically, come in and said, look, this is, this is good. So next up, he draws this really, really cool graph. This is such a brilliant graph. Check this out. So imagine if one curve were women and one curve were men, right? We could think of whatever trait. The thing that I think about right now is upper body strength. You know, on average, a man has more upper body strength than women. But because everyone's different, because of a distribution of population, there will be some women whose, whose upper body strength matches or better than men. But just the, the mean, right? This is called the mean. The mean is going to be a little higher for men. This is the perfect little graph. And what he's trying to show with this is, look, you can, you can do this with other traits, other behaviors, etc. because of genetic differences and also not just genetic differences, but also how they're acculturated, right? Society teaches differently and it helps turn on different genes also. So, personality differences. Women on average have more openness directed towards feelings and aesthetics rather than ideas. Women generally also have a stronger interest in people rather than things relative to men. Also interpreted as empathizing versus systemizing. Very interesting. I've never heard of the word systemizing. These two differences in part explain why women prefer jobs in social or artistic areas. More men may like coding because it requires systemizing. And even within SWEs, what does SWEs mean? Oh, I should have done research. My bad, guys. Um, comparatively, more women work on front end, which deals with both people and aesthetics. Extroversion expressed as gregariousness. Gregariousness as in being liked by everyone or being the person that everyone knows rather than assertiveness. Assertiveness as in stating your point, being able to express yourself, right? Also higher agreeableness. That's what women have on average. Neuroticism. So women on average have more neuroticism. That's what he says. And he defines neuroticism as higher anxiety, lower stress tolerance, and this may contribute to the higher levels of anxiety women report on Google Geist. I guess Google Geist is some sort of internal Google program. And to the lower number of women in high stress jobs. Although I would say parenting is pretty high stress. So I don't know how women do that. But note that contrary to what a social constructionist would argue, research suggests that greater nation level gender equality leads to psychological dissimilarity in men's and women's personality traits. So the more you try to put men and women on an equal playing field, which is good, right? It actually makes it so men and women's natural psychological dissimilarities get emphasized. And why does he say this? This is what he says. Because as society, actually he's quoting this, as society becomes more prosperous and more egalitarian, innate, as in it's in the body, it's in your genes, innate dispositional differences between men and women have more space to develop and the gap that exists between men and women in the personality traits becomes wider. In other words, you try your best to make men and women compete and to have the same benefits, have the same results. You then give them because now, you know, they, they, they have everything given to them, right? It gives their natural dispositions more opportunity to blossom. It's very interesting. I never thought about it that way, but very interesting, very smart. And well, he got it from someone else. So giving you too much credit, James Damore. Anyways. So the next section, oh, before that he says, we need to stop assuming that gender gaps imply sexism. So the next one is men's higher drive for status. Men just value status, right? Although I would argue that women value status just in different ways, right? Men might want to conquer the hill, but women might want to 
um, have kids with the guy who conquers the hill, right? It's a, it's a different way of achieving status. But anyways, we always ask why we don't see women in top leadership positions, but we never ask why we see so many men in these jobs exactly. Instead of asking why they don't exist, we ask why these people do exist. I like that. See, these positions often require long, stressful hours that may not be worth it if you want a balanced and fulfilling life. Status is a primary metric that men are judged on, pushing many men into these higher paying, less satisfying jobs for the status that they entail. Note, the same forces, this part is awesome and it warms my heart, he dresses this, watch. Note, the same forces that lead men into high pay, high stress jobs in tech and leadership cause men to take undesirable and dangerous jobs like coal mining, garbage collection, and firefighting, and suffer 93% of work-related deaths. This guy's done his research. 90% of 93% of all work-related deaths are caused are men. And also, just so you know, men commit suicide. I think the ratio is like five to one. It's it's horrible. Successful suicides, men commit suicide way higher than women. He's saying that this drive for success it also has you know some of these bad consequences. Absolutely. So this is very interesting. Now he's, he's diagnosed some of the issues and now he has solutions, right? Non-discriminatory ways to reduce the gender gap. This is gonna be interesting. So before I go over some of the difference in distribution of traits um, that I outlined in a previous section and suggest ways to increase women's representation in tech without resorting to discrimination, Google is already making strides in many of these areas. But I think it's inclusive to list them. So he's like, yeah, you know, I'm giving Google credit. I think Google's doing a lot of good. And it's paying attention to some of this, but I feel like it could do it more, right? He's being very reasonable throughout all this. I don't see any anti-diversity. I don't know what the media is saying. So here's what Dan Moore says. Women on average show a higher interest in people and men in things. So he, he talked about that already. We can make software engineering more people-oriented with pair programming and more collaboration. I don't know about you guys, but back when I programmed, I definitely had some fun programming with people. We would discuss problems together, kind of write it out on the board. So yes, um, that could work. Unfortunately, there may be limits to how people-oriented certain roles that Google can be, and we shouldn't deceive ourselves or our students into thinking otherwise. I mean, yeah, I mean, everyone, at Google, everyone who are in higher tech probably has some social issues, right? So they probably would prefer, a majority would prefer to just be like, leave me the fuck alone, let me figure this out myself. I don't know if I, if I became a programmer, would I? I'd probably find a balance, but inevitably I'd probably spend a lot of time alone too. Women are on average more cooperative. You see, this is not actually true. This is one of the few places I really take issue with. Women are actually not more cooperative. If you look at the research, women with women, it's at least equally cooperative as men with men. So men and men are equally as cooperative as women with women. And there's even some research to suggest that men with men are actually more cooperative than women with women. So he's making a, an assumption here, and I think it's probably, this is partly due to what our culture says, right? Our culture's like, yeah, little girls, starting when they're young, they sit together, have tea parties, boys are like, pew, 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 I kill you, yeah! Um, but yeah, so he, he makes a wrong assumption, which is not proven by research, and so what he says, his, his um, suggestion is, allow these exhibiting cooperative behavior to thrive. Recent updates to some program, uh, but we could do more. That doesn't mean we should remove all competitiveness from Google or hell. I mean, if Google wasn't competitive, they wouldn't become number one, search engine that is, and not in China. But anyways, women on average are more prone to anxiety, so what does he recommend we do? Um, make tech and leadership less stressful. Yeah, good luck with that. Google already partly does this with many stress reduction courses and benefits. Oh, I see what he's talking about, all right. That's true, you know. Encourage all these leaders, whether they're men or women, to take breaks more, to do yoga. I mean, Google does that. I mean, have you seen any Google offices? They got like slides, they got catered food, healthy food. Now, they could make themselves healthier if they added like a squatty potty or um, if they added a step and go. Uh, you poop better, your whole body's better, but that's another obsession of mine. That's, I'm not gonna talk more and bore you guys with that. Women on average look for more work-life balance while men have higher drive for success. 
Yeah, and unfortunately, this is what he says, unfortunately, as long as tech and leadership remain high status, lucrative careers, men may di disproportionately want to be in them. Yeah, I mean, this is unfortunately just biological clocks, right? A man who's 80, as long as he hasn't eaten like shit and gotten kicked in the balls a few times, I think he can still have children. The children may not be as high quality as and their immune systems might not be strong, their intelligence might not be as high as let's say if the man had his kid when he was 30 or 20, but an 80 year old woman would just not be able to have a baby. The only way an 80 year old woman could have a baby is if she saved her egg when she was 20 and then when she's 80 she got some other person to donate a sperm and then they planted the egg into her uterus and that way she's carrying the baby but she can't conceive, that's what I mean. So women have this clock, right? They're this biological clock. So yes, they're more likely to value family or at least having a kid. When you have a kid, very likely you have to start over in your career, right? Or you're more likely to be homebound. I mean, when I was in college, I took this neuroscience class where the TA was this lady who had a baby and she carried her, she wheeled, she wheeled, she wheeled her baby into class every day to, to um, be there with her baby in case her baby needed something. But that's how committed she was. It was crazy. The male gender role is currently inflexible. Oh, I love when he says that. I see some tinges of men's rights activism in him. What he's saying is, it's not that allowed in society for men to be feminine. Sure, you know, the left says, yeah, fuck gender roles, men can do anything. But seriously, if you're a man who kind of expects a woman to take care of you, I don't care who you are. Like, even Hillary Clinton, who claims to be a champion of the left, is gonna look down on guys who are like, yeah, I'll just let my wife take care of me, or I'll just let this woman, I'll just let society take care of me, right? This is, there's definitely, if you're not a bread owner, of the relationship, then you better be independent and not be in a relationship. Because if you're kind of dependent on whether your parents or whether anyone else, or you, you try, even if you just try to show too much emotion, you show anything what he calls feminine, yes, yeah, society can't really accept that. So yeah, that's something that either we just have to embrace that men and women have certain gender roles or we just have to get rid of this. But as of now, the male gender role is inflexible and it hurts a lot of men. That's very true. So, so then he, after talking about all of this, he then talks about the harm of Google's biases. I think this is the part that might piss off Google. So the previous part pissed off just regular people, right? Whether they read it or not, it'll piss them off. If they read it, they might still emotionally resist a lot of this. But so now Google, he talks about Google. He does not agree with certain discriminatory practices and here he lists a bunch of them. Programs, mentoring, and classes only for people with a certain gender or race. See, when I was in college, we had things like the Black Student Union or the Chinese Student Union, but we never said, hey, if you're, if you're not of this particular ethnic group or this particular trait, you, you get the fuck out, don't join. You know, we, we, we never said that, so I guess, What's implied in this is they literally have certain programs, certain classes where, let's say it's for, it's for black people. If you're Asian, then you can't even sign up for it. That's very interesting. So that takes what I experienced in college and to another level. Uh, a high priority queue, special treatment for diversity candidates. I mean, this is a debate, affirmative action basically. There's another way of um, framing affirmative action. So this is just something that our society is gonna grapple with for a while. Hiring practices which can effectively lower the bar for diversity candidates by decreasing the false negative rate. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, basically, he's, he's just highlighting different things that Google does to favor diversity, put diversity as one of its missions, and it negatively affects both employees and it negatively affects the efficiency and the quality of Google products. It's true. Um, these practices are based on false assumptions generated by our biases and can actually increase race and gender tensions. It's true. If you hire someone because he's black, the whole time he's gonna be thinking, oh, man, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a black person here, oh my God, um, oh, this person says something to me, oh, it could be because of him, I'm black, oh my God. If you bring in a group of people expressly because they're certain ethnicity or certain gender or whatever, I think you're more likely to create, even though you have more of certain groups of people, you're actually gonna create more segregation. They're, they're not gonna integrate as much because 
you're hiring and emphasizing the fact that they're different. So the whole time they're going to think they're, that's the only thing that's going to be on their mind, right? All right. So why we're blind. This is his next section. We all have biases and use motivated reasoning to dismiss, to dismiss ideas that run counter towards our internal values. He talks about the different, different sort of confirmation biases that, that the left and the right has. I like this part. In addition to the left's affinity for those it sees as weak, humans in ge are generally biased towards protecting females. No doubt about that. I mean, I think every male, whether it's inherent or it's given to them through years and years of society's education, you're going to want to protect that physically weaker member of society that's a female. It's just something that's in our brains. That's absolutely true. As mentioned before, this likely evolved because males are biologically disposable. Oh my God. Let's talk about men being disposable, right? Think about the current tensions with North Korea. If we did fight a war, who's going to fight the war? It's going to be the men that get sent out to fight the war. Why are men disposable? It's, again, related to biology. A woman can carry, let's say, 100 eggs. Um, I don't know how many the ova produce. I think it's like 100 eggs. I don't know. But in, in her lifetime, if she fucks like crazy, she might have 20 kids, right? That's the most she can have. But she's the one that carries the baby. So without the woman, you cannot produce the next generation. So you need women in a community. But men, you know, fuck them. Every man, he can, he can, he can spray millions of sperm everywhere. And so let's say you have a community of like 10 women and two men. That community will survive. But you have a community that's like, Two women and ten men, then the, if they survive, they're going to be incestuous as fuck, right? So, it's it's all related to biology, and that's why men aren't disposable. And it's very interesting that he used that word. They're biologically disposable. I wonder if our man has read a little bit of men's rights literature or something like that, because it's I I, I wouldn't expect him to use terms like biologically disposable, but it's good. That, he realizes that, I mean, unfortunately, if, if society had to choose, you know, if it's, they're going to sacrifice the lives of men. It's unfortunate, but part of why it's empowering to know this fact is, if you know you're disposable, why give a fuck about what society thinks and expects you to do? You can go off on your own. As long as you're not hurting other people, you do your own thing, right? But when a man complains about a gender issue affecting men, he's labeled as a misogynist. Yes, because he's not considering women issues, so he's a misogynist for caring about men. And a whiner, hell yeah. Nearly every difference between men and women is interpreted as a form of women's oppression, hell yeah. As with many things in life, gender differences are often a case of grass being greener on the other side. Unfortunately, taxpayer and Google money is spent to water only one side of the lawn. Yep. Very good. Next up, he gives some suggestions, right? Because he's pointed out all these issues. He's kind of brought some unfortunate, um, I don't agree with all of it, but mostly I agree with a lot of these truths he's brought to, to light. So while Google hasn't harbored the violent leftist protests that we're seeing at universities, the frequent shaming in our culture has created some silent, psychologically unsafe environment. So I guess if he's the, from what I know, from these interviews I heard him speak, a lot of his coworkers agree with him. So I think a lot of people silently at Google think this way. So let's look at this. Here are his, this is his suggestion page. So let's look at this. Um, my larger point, this is something I, I outlined. My larger point is that we have an intolerance for ideas and evidence that don't fit a certain ideology. So he's saying at Google, if you don't fit the certain ideology of fairness and helping the weak and women are oppressed and minorities are oppressed, then they're just not even going to tolerate your whatever evidence, whatever discussion you try to bring up. So, all right, anyways, I'm just going to stop talking and go to his suggestions. My concrete suggestions are to demoralize diversity. What does he mean by demoralize diversity? As soon as we start to moralize an issue, as in making it right or wrong, or a must, you know, you must do this, we stop thinking about it in terms of cost and benefits. 
Dismissing anyone that disagrees as immoral and harshly punish those we see as villains to protect the victim. It's true because I don't know if any of you have heard of what's called a zero-sum game. Zero-sum game is there's winner and loser, right? So you, when you make it a moral issue, it's like he's either on your side or he's not on your side, right? Because you make it about right or wrong. Oh, I'm right. He disagrees with me. He's wrong. He's, he's like, so you, you see the problem with that? I totally agree. So stop alienating conservatives. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean... I think our culture, unless you grew up in the South, right? I know many people who moved to the North from the South, and in the South, that's not the issue, but I guess at Google, at any company that's, that's um, these big companies, yes, if you're a conservative, you definitely have to stay in the closet a little bit. That's very true. Um, what he says, alienating conservatives is both non-inclusive and generally bad business because conservative tend to have a tend to be higher in conscientiousness mm. which is required for much of the drudgery and maintenance work characteristics of a mature company so you're saying conservatives I don't know if conscientiousness implies works harder but maybe they're more likely to adhere to whatever they agreed with right so if Every Friday you have to come in for an hour longer because I'm, I'm assuming at Google everyone works like 10 to 12 hours, right? So if you have to work longer hours, maybe conservatives are more likely to just accept it and liberals are more like, oh fuck, but um, it's my right to leave early. So I just leave early even though I didn't get my job done and we have labor rights and all that. I don't know, I think, I'm assuming that's what he's saying. Um, he also suggests we confront Google's biases. Yeah, that's true. How can you, how can you improve if you don't examine yourself once in a while? That's very, very true. I've been examining myself recently and I just realized I haven't been eating dinner on time. I mean, I'm sometimes skipping dinner or I'm eating dinner too late and it's like, this, it's not good for my health. So today, before I recorded this, I ate a very good healthy salad. You know, it's like you have to always, I could have just pushed this issue aside, but I, it's like, no, you have to, you have to confront these issues and then you move forward, right? If you're thinking from a company's perspective, if you keep losing sales, do you just brush it under the rug or do you go like, hey, there's something wrong with what we're doing. Let's learn what we're doing wrong. Anyways, stop restricting programs and classes to certain genders or race. That's true, right? Don't reverse discriminate. It does. It's one thing to say, look, we have this class and we want to encourage these people to attend but don't it's another step to say okay other people aren't allowed to attend even in a liberal college like my college we never did that have an open and honest discussion about the costs and benefits of our diversity program that's right but again to accept this you have to accept that diversity is not a moral issue right so you have to have this assumption already agreed with so if you don't if you think it's a must or if you think it's a moral issue it's, it's an issue of justice then you're not going to agree with this point that we should do a cost benefit analysis the next step that Damore talks about is focus on psychological safety psychological safety not just diversity it's true what he says is we should focus on psychological safety which has been shown positive effects and should hopefully not lead to unfair discrimination Having representative viewpoints is important for those designing and testing our products, but the benefits are less clear for those uh, more removed from UX. Yes, that's true, right? So when you're testing a product, I, I work in a tech company, and when you're testing a product, you don't, you wanna do at least what's called an A-B test, right? You get, you test one thing, you change the variable up, that one, one variable, you test it, and you see which one does better. And it's the same thing. You can't just have one view, not just in UX, but in everything. Because how will you know what does better, right? See, he's thinking about all this from a cost-benefit perspective, and it's gonna go over the heads of a lot of people because a lot of people think of diversity as a moral issue. So I can really, I really now kind of see that even if you sit down and read this and really understand his points, you might never agree with some of his stuff because, you know, if you, if you think fairness, right, if you think egalitarianism is an inherent right, as in 
that person makes two million bucks more than I do. He should give me some of his money so that I make the same. So if you inherently believe that, then you're probably never going to see cost benefit analysis. A lot of these tenants of capitalism just won't appeal to you. But again, you know, let's hope most people in America, at least we do accept some of the tenants of America. I don't know. You know um, in philosophy, David Hume criticized John Locke a lot for the social contract because what David Hume said was, you know, a lot of people are born into a system. They didn't make a social contract with the state. It's literally like if you set a ship out to sea and then said, okay, you can agree with the rules on the ship or you can jump out to sea, right? That's what David Hume criticized. I'm getting all philosophical, but so maybe some people, you know, they, they inherently don't want to function in capitalism. They don't like capitalism. They're like, well, I was born into this. What can I do? It's not like I can go to Russia. I mean, you can go to Russia and just settle down, but it's not as easy as you think. Anyways, going back on point. Wow, I really got deep. This is a very interesting point he emphasized. This is, Damore says, de-emphasize empathy. I've heard several calls for increased empathy on diversity issues. Why I strongly support trying to understand how and why people think the way they do, relying on an affective empathy, feeling another's pain, causes us to focus on anecdotes, favor individuals similar to us, and harbor other irrational and dangerous biases. Being emotionally unengaged helps us better reason about the facts. Okay, I'm gonna disagree with him on this point. So I'm gonna tell you guys something. Conservatives, right? especially when they're in big cities, a lot of times they feel so alienated. They feel so, they feel the culture's against them. So they actually get together in this like secret um, clubs or they get together and they have their own little meetups. They have their own little like safe spaces almost. It's really funny. But if you don't see the sense of alienation, the sense of apparent intolerance that they experience, you, you, you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to turn off your emotions and then be able to think rationally. That's what I don't agree with him about. Sometimes to be able to think rationally, you have to be able to empathize, like real empathize, not like oh my god, oh yeah, you know, slavery's bad. I feel for black people, but like go to the fucking hood and like see what they have to go through. Then maybe you could objectively think about okay, how can we solve these problems? A few months ago, uh, one of the ladies that runs the building that I used to be in, um, she angered me and then I, I, I like got back at her and then she called me out and we, we, we had a heart to heart and I didn't realize that, you know, she had a lot of the similar experiences that I had. And because I got to empathize with her, I got to step in her shoes and realize, oh shit, she's also, you know, she, she's been a minority in a different country before. She knows what it feels like to have people who don't understand you. And then I stopped being like, well, fuck this lady. Let's try to ruin her. And then I just, I was like, okay, here, let's, let's do this to try to work past our problems. And then now whenever I see her, we still say hi, we're still friendly. But if I didn't empathize with her, if she didn't allow me, if she didn't open herself up and let me empathize with some of the stuff she's gone through, I might have just kept judging her and then I would have just never been able to look at her rationally. So empathy is essential, man. I mean, before I realized how oppressed conservatives felt because I've all my life been taught, oh, it's the conservatives oppressing minorities and oppressing women and all that. Until I realized how, how conservatives felt oppressed too by the the way society's going and how, you know, certain men feel oppressed too by how feminism and, you know, fourth wave gynocentrism is going. Then you can, after you feel for them, then you can try to understand your feelings and hopefully you can do it rationally. So I really, I don't agree with this point at all. De-emphasize empathy. All this other stuff, good, but you have to teach people to be more empathetic. I feel like one of the reasons why society is going so downhill our fucking phones and everything, we're so just used to creating our own fucking reality. I know I'm cursing now, but I'm very passionate about this. We're so used to creating our reality that it's turned off our empathy because everyone is projecting an image and everyone's not all the time even looking each other in the eye anymore. It's bad, man. Anyways, prioritize intention. I, I think that's a, that's a really good point he makes. 
you know, sometimes you do things and they don't turn out well. Um, it's not always your fault, right? You know, if you make a business decision and it doesn't turn out well, you better learn from that and not repeat it. But it's not completely your fault if it's like you weighed all the options and you made this decision and then something just unfortunate happened or something you didn't think about happened, right? So yeah, folk prioritize intentions or in the case of diversity, oh, I get this so much, man. I had a roommate back in freshman year no, he wasn't a roommate. He was my roommate later on, but um, freshman year I knew him, and he was creepy sometimes when he was talking to girls, and the word spread pretty fast. Like, yeah, he used to creep on this girl. It's like, no, he was just fucking awkward. That guy had Asperger's. So his intention wasn't to try to creep people out or to stalk or anything. His intention was just to try to make a friend. He didn't know how to interact with females, but no one focused on his intentions, but you know, we can give a million examples for this. I mean, really applied to this is, isn't the intention of a, of a company to not hire women? No, you know, based on all the other facts, all these other things he's laid out, sometimes the results weren't intended. It's just what happened, you know, due to circumstances, due to biology, due to all this stuff. Be open about the science of human nature. That's very true, man. Honestly, sometimes I have that problem too. I. I've been taught so much and I truly believe it's going to take a while for me and I don't think I'm ever going to drop this because again, there is a lot of proof in life that nurture plays an even more important role than nature. With that being said though, nature does play a pretty big role in how a person develops. I mean, you know twin studies, you have twins identical so their genes are absolutely 100% identical. Sometimes by circumstances beyond their control, they get separated. And then years later, when they reunite, you know what happens? You'd be surprised how much stuff they share in common, raised by different places, raised by different people, but genetically similar. And there have been cases where they smoke the same cigar, they, they're dating the same type of person. In fact, they're even dating the same type of person with the same exact name. It's crazy. Maybe they pick the same majors. It's, so biology does have a big effect on people. So yes, something I need to remind myself too. Sometimes when someone says something like, oh man, you Asian, you're just inherently um, more smart at things. Sometimes I'm like, what the fuck? Are you living in the 19th century? But then I have to remind myself, hey, let's actually look at the evidence. Maybe this person is basing it on some evidence. Although I truly believe that, here's what I think. Um, it's not that Asians are smart, it's just that a lot of the Asian immigrants that came to America, the reason why they could even come to America on a visa that was not a refugee visa was because they had some brains, right? They either had business skills as they could make money and immigrate that way, or they had, um, they had uh, um, intellectual skills so they could immigrate through being a scholar or being a very qualified, talented brain, or they had manipulation social skills, they could marry someone to, you know, then get the green card that way. So immigration, right? America's immigration policy is filtered for high IQ Asians. I could make an argument like that. Years, probably even two years ago, I wouldn't have made that argument, but I could see, I could see why someone could make an argument like that. But anyways, um, Reconsider making unconscious bias training mandatory for pro committees. So interesting, or promo committees. So I guess in Google they have something called unconscious bias training. You know, you know I work at a I work at a tech company. It's a it's a comp it's a Chinese tech company. We don't have any of that stuff. It's really funny. And almost done, guys. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. It's I think I've learned a lot. I've thought about a lot of stuff. We haven't been able to measure any effect of our unconscious training. Um, yeah, basically, he's, he, this is more an internal critique, but there we go, that was his. That, that was his memo, Google's ideological echo chamber, how biased clouds are thinking about diversity and inclusion. So, we read it, man, we got through it, 10 pages, and I hope you realize he's not anti-diversity. He's trying to balance this sense of diversity and inclusiveness with what he was hired to do at a company, which is make the company grow and make the company more efficient. 
You know, there's certain things that they do at Google that he's determined are not helping the company grow and not helping the company become more efficient. So he's just trying to figure out a way to make it more efficient. I mean, that's all he's doing. It's not anti-diversity. I hate those fucking titles from all these news outlets that are saying it's anti-diversity. It's not anti-diversity. Is it a little hard for some people to grasp? I mean, I understand a lot of his points because I've studied the philosophy, the political science, the psychology behind all this. Maybe some people haven't. Maybe they're not going to understand what he's saying. So what does this say? One, actually read something before you judge. But two, I think all of us as a service to our democracy should just get more acquainted with social psychology. We should learn a little bit about philosophy, learn a little political science. So whenever something like this occurs, we can pull from the social sciences and pull from biology and be able to be like, oh, I see what he's getting at or I see what he misunderstands. Instead of being like, yeah, fuck the gut, pro men, oh, anti-diversity, yeah, blah, autistic, oh my God. And, you know, that, that doesn't get us anywhere. And James Damore, if you want to talk to me, please, I really want to interview you. If you see this, please, man, I think out of all the people who've talked about your memo, I think I went the most in depth in this. So I would love to talk to you, man, please. And I know you're going to go go far in life, man. So don't let the haters, don't let the people who didn't bother collecting the information, don't let them get you down. Um, one day society is going to thank you because the thing about democracy I've talked about before, because you have to have a majority to do anything. Eventually, if a, if a certain group of people lead society too far one way, it'll swing back. That's just... Let's hope or else society will collapse or will blow the world to smithereens. But anyways, this was Jerry. And to all of you watching or regulars, thank you. To all of you who just discovered this by accident, thank you. For all of you who um, watch this and are offended, um, don't be offended and think or turn that offensiveness and go do your own research and then um, refute me if you want to or just justify your own opinions privately through actual evidence. All right, thank you guys so much. Talk to you guys next time.